Okay, great. All right, I'm Barbara Garrity Blake, and I'm here on Lennoxville Road in Mr. Johnny Simpson's house, talking to Johnny on November 6th, 2009. So, Johnny, why don't we start off with you telling us what year you were born and where exactly did you grow up? I was born in 1938, and actually, the house that was there is gone now, but well, it's, it's right up the road here across that ditch up here. Uh, Michael Tickle lives in it. Mm -hmm. That was Mother's house. Used to be down there, the last house on the left on the road. Oh, and when you were born, that's where it was on mm -hmm. the end? Were you born at home? Mm-hmm. Really? All, well, yeah, all, my, I had uh, uh, four sisters, and well, I I had I only had one brother that lived. The one older than me died when he was just he was I think he was born thirty seven, but he died. Oh. Right after birth, not long. Mm -hmm. So then I come along. And what do they call this neighborhood when you were coming up? Black Cat. <laughs> so you were born in Black Cat. <laughs> Can you tell us why they call it Black Cat? They called it Black Cat because they had a black beach down there. And they had a pavilion down there. And I don't know if it was built for the blacks or whether they, it just let the blacks have it or what. Mm -hmm. But when I was young, every summer, busloads of them would come down to the end of the road and they would walk down there through the path and have picnics down there, go swimming. I think the... When I was still probably in the late forties, they had a couple of them got over, got too deep out there, and that current took them. They got drowned. Mm -hmm. Well, was the swimming good with all these fish factories right along the way? Oh yeah, we swam in it all the time. Was there ever a lot of foam and stink and stuff? Yeah, there was a whole lot of. Uh, uh, most of it was. You wouldn't go swimming usually if the factory was running, if the tide was rising, which would be going this way. So we would go swimming when the tide was falling. Ah. And try to do it when the factory wasn't running. So, but it didn't bother us too much. We were used to it. But it was mostly facial. That's what we call gurry. The the fish oil? Yeah. Well, see what the way they. I never really really understood. I do, in a way that but all them tanks was in the factory there. That we didn't use. I mean, we did use for a while two of them on the end. They were white the before they got the oil machines. The fish oil would go in them tanks, the water and the oil. Well, the tanks were fixed so that on the top of it they had a, a gate. One tank would be a little higher than the next one. Mm -hmm. And they'd have a gate there, but when the tank got full enough they'd open that gate and it would go in the second tank. Well, the oil would run off the top. Mm -hmm into that next time and then they do and put it run in front of the factory into another one while this one they would run it down the line till they would get all the oil out of it till when they got to the end it was mostly just near about pure oil but not like it was after they got oil machines okay i gotcha they had a good they called it skimming they'd have long sticks and they would push the oil off the top of the water. But what's gurry? Well, they had these deep, big plugs. It was just a long pole, and they'd have a big pipe in the bottom of the tank, and they had a, a wooden plug on that thing, and they would shove that down in that while they were doing up this. When they got through, they would pull the plug and let the water out, and the water went overboard. Plus, a lot of oil. <laughs> Not a whole lot, but you know, what they couldn't 
save, it went overboard. Oh, so that stuff would be in Taylor's Creek. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's still there. There's still, you go down there. Well, I don't know about now because there hadn't been that much of it got overboard in the last 20 years. But for years, you go certain times, you could go down there if you were digging something along the shore, you would come to a white sandy, you come to a brown or gray looking area and you could smell it. You knew what it was, it was gurry. <laughs> I gotcha. So Johnny, um, I know that your father was foreman of the plant, right, yeah. at Beaufort Fisheries, mm -hmm. and then you were foreman of the plant. So before we get into that history, could you just describe to me what was the job of a foreman at a fish factory? He basically, uh, he hired the men, fired them. Who hired the men? The foreman. Okay. I did when I was there, and Daddy before me, and Popsicle, and there wasn't too many fired. They quit a whole lot of times. Mm -hmm. Couldn't stand it. But the old fellows that worked there for years, there were some of them worked there for 40, 50 years. There was two or three that was old when Daddy was running it. When I was young, I started working there when I was about 50. I mean, in 53 or 54. Mm -hmm. I was at, uh, let's see, 38, 48, 53. I was about 14, 15 when I first went there. I, Daddy took me up there to help the man in the kitchen across the road. and uh, The cookhouse. Cookhouse. So I worked in the summer for one year. Next year I started, and they weren't catching any fish. Daddy had to lay me off, so they couldn't get no men on the boats. So a bunch of us youngins were on Old Lloyd T with uh, Gene Dudley, which was one of these old uh, sharpies with the, with the pilot house on the stern. I don't know, I don't even have a picture of one of them. Was it then motorized? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they had engines on them. Uh-huh. And uh, had engines in the perp boats. Old Lathrop, old poor cylinder Lathrop. But it wasn't nothing like they had when you went down there. Yeah. You wouldn't believe the difference. And they could make probably three, four sets time it take us to make one. <laughs> How about that? And uh, anyway... I worked the rest of that summer on that. Went back to school. Next summer I worked in the kitchen. And I was tired of that, so the next summer I went fishing on the core sign. I don't know if you ever saw her. Did you ever see her? One of them white sound boats. They must have sold her before you come down there. They were selling a lot of them down on the Gulf, and people were using them use them for bait boats. Mm -hmm. They were getting them for uh, feed for crawfish and stuff like that. Fish ponds. Anyway, let's see if it's I fished with George on the course sign that year and I, I didn't, I said I wasn't going to school. I, well, I Failed eleventh grade. I went back and finished it, and I should have gone on. But all the ones I went to school with were getting out that year, so I said I ain't going back. So I happened to come in when I think it was probably up in the first of October. They usually cut out earlier than that, and they were going to fish about two more weeks, and I happened to go up one Saturday. We we always fish Saturday morning at the end, whether there was any fish or not. Mm -hmm. You work 49 hours a week in the factory. And uh, nine hours a day plus five on Saturday. Uh, that's, yeah, 40, no, four on Saturday, 40, 49. And uh, so the boy that was helping Bertie in the kitchen, I bet him, he was running up the road, 
He jumped in the back of the truck, and I just remember asking him, how come you, ain't you going to finish up there? He said, oh, I'd quit. I ain't doing that no more. So I went there, and I asked Eddie, he was, he was in there eating, I asked him if, uh, I said, that Wallace told me he quit. I said, can I have the job? <laughs> he said, if he's quit, you can have it. He said, wait, let me find out. What was his job? He was helping in the cook. Oh, okay. Bertie, old man Bertie Piner. Mm -hmm. He was an old fellow from Williston. He was, daddy had grown up with him down there. See, he grew up down there, Smyrna, Williston. Mm -hmm. So, actually he was kid to us. <laughs> And which everybody was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's when I started. I was, let's see, I was 17, I think, that September. So that's when I went to work steady. And then eventually you worked your way up to being foreman. Yeah. Uh, my father ran it till 72. He died in 72. Popsicle took it over. What was Popsicle's last name? Pospisil. What was his first name? Ludwig. Ludwig Popsicil? Yeah, Pos <laughs> no wonder they called him Pospisil. Popsicle. <laughs> <laughs> he, he would never, I think he finally did tell me what his middle name was. But Where was he from? Janice, his, his middle name. He was um South Dakota. His or, middle name was Janice? Yeah, Ludwig Janice Pospisil. Bless his heart. But he, I don't think he ever told me that till just before he died. <laughs> anyway, he was, he run it from 72 to 82. And he was going to uh, retire at 62. He said all his brothers and sisters, they had all of them died early from heart attack. He wasn't going to take no chance. Mm -hmm. He was retiring on Friday, on Thursday evening. One of the boats, sound boats come in, brought him some fish. He cleaned them down there on the dock and carried them home, put them in a house, his wife said, and was walking back out to his car and fell down in the yard and had a stroke. You're kidding. Mm -hmm. Nope, he died Friday night. Friday evening or Friday night. And had he yet retired? He was just going to retire. He was just leaving. He had asked Piggy to, if he would uh, let him work part-time, pay him under the table. And Piggy, you want me to, Piggy wouldn't get rid of him too, I think. You want me to be a crook? So he was bad with Piggy. And that was when Jewel and him, I ain't gonna get into that, how they got Piggy out, but anyway. Yeah, well how did you learn how to be a foreman? Well, I worked down in the factory during the spring when I was cooking, while they, you know, they were rebuilding the factory and everything, plus I was down there all the time they were running, I was more interested in what was going on in the factory than what was a, going on in the cook house. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't interested in the cook house. Were you interested in the machinery oh, and yeah. how the whole process worked? Yeah. And I talk, I'd go there with the men that were running the stuff and ask them how it worked and all that. See, there was something Jewel didn't never realize. The men did run the factory. They knew how to run it. They'd been running it for years and years and years, and Daddy had really made them do it right to start with. And and Jewel said they didn't run the factory? No, no, no. He said they did. Mm -hmm. And I always was wondering, I'd say, well, what in the hell are you paying me for? Oh, I got you. If, he, if they're running the factory, what good am I? He found out after I left. <laughs> John, you said that the job of a foreman was to hire the men, but it was much more than oh, that. Oh, yeah. Could you tell me what, what else it entailed? Well, you, you uh, had to make sure that they run it right, and go down, check on everything, and see if it was running like it was supposed to. 
if it was going through the scrap house like it was supposed to, if it come out up there in the scrap house like it was supposed to, I knew it was doing all right. I could go back and get in my camp. <laughs> I tell them something happened, come get me. What was your camp? Uh, that office, that same one that pops. Oh, well, you never saw a popsicle, though, did you? That's right. Well, anyway, they had built it. Biggie had built it there for a popsicle. Half of it was the watchman shack. The other half was the foreman's house. The, the side on the uh, east, mm -hmm. pointing that way. And I, oh, uh, anyway, there were some good times, bad well, times. What was the hardest thing about being the foreman at Beaufort Fisheries? Well, I don't really want to say what the hardest part of it was there for me, but, uh, well, I will. It was because I didn't, I couldn't keep the plan up. Didn't have no money to keep it up. I knew it was falling down, and there was nothing I could do about it. And I think I lost interest in the last two or three years. And yet, even though Beaufort Fisheries had old equipment, it was one of the top producing factories, wasn't it? Well, for what they had there, yeah. So y'all must have really been knowing how to patch things together. Oh, yeah, yeah. But see, all them older men that knew what to do with all that stuff, they were leaving. I mean, well, dying, actually. Getting so old, they couldn't work. Some of them down there were working. They said they're probably 80 years old. Mm. They knew what to do, but they, you know, they couldn't do no real hard work. I'd say, Julie, roofs are falling to pieces. The place that the waters are running all over the electrical boxes. You can't have that. We ain't got no money. Popsicle. Daddy always had a carpenter. Always had a mechanic. Always had welders. Popsicle had a carpenter. Always had mechanics. Always had welders. When I took over, I didn't have nothing. He wouldn't let me have a carpenter. He had a carpenter down there. Kirby, I don't know if you ever remember seeing him anyway. I went to him one day and I said, Kirby, I, I'm gonna come here, I want you to see what, something I need that really, really needs fixing bad. He said, Johnny, Joe told me not to do nothing unless he told me to do it. Mm -hmm. I said, Okay, no problem. Damn place can fall down. I don't care. And that's the way I felt about it. Mm -hmm. Made me one year. He wouldn't let me buy any paint, but all the steam pipes, the dryers, all the paint had finally all going off. They've always been painted every year, especially in the first of summer. They were everything was pretty anyway. I went up to Barber's. In fact, I went to Huntley's and Barber's. And got them to buy, to order me some hot pipe aluminum. I don't know, it was probably maybe a hundred gallons or something. Because it goes a long way. But I told Barber's, I said, now don't say nothing to Jewel about the bill until they get the patient. I said, once they get the patient, making a little bit of money, maybe he won't say nothing. But old, what's his name that run Barber's at the time, I guess he didn't get the message and he wanted his money and went down there. <laughs> uh, you can't blame him. <laughs> no, and told Jewel he wanted money for that paint. And Jewel caught me in there on the carpet. I don't think I'd be done it about three or four years in. It was long enough everything was getting a look so bad. And uh, I said, Joe, he said, didn't I tell you not to order any paint? I said, you sure did. But why did you order it? I said, I thought I could sneak it by you. I said, but Joe, I ain't got no use for hot pipe aluminum paint. He says, I know what you ordered. He said, what? He said, I know what you ordered it for. Oh. But 
I said, I'll send it back. And I did. I mm -hmm. told I hated to tell him to do it. I said, but I can't pay for it, and he ain't going to. I said, but he won't have to worry about me ordering any more paint for this factory. And I did. I never bought another damn gallon for nothing. Mm. Like when Robert Allen took over in there, if I had to have something that need, you know, we really had to do, I'd tell him to get it. I didn't buy no more. Well, Johnny, what was what what was the best thing about working at the factory? Well, it was more or less a steady job. And uh I did I really loved it. And and why did you love it? I, well I was raised in it. Mhm. Mm See, when I was little, Daddy, we used to go up north. He was up with Harvey Smith. Smith, up there, the, the museum and stuff. That, yeah, the Smith Fish that Mill Company. That was his money. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they had the plant was over here on West Beaufort there. <clears throat> well, he had plants all over. And Daddy and his daddy worked before him. See, Papa Lee and Daddy's daddy was a piece factory. In fact, Papa Lynn and Daddy run that one down there to Smyrna. Is Papa Lynn, is that your grandfather? Mm hmm Daddy's Daddy. Golly. And, uh... They ran the one down in Smyrna? Yeah. Huh. Uh, anyway, Daddy was working, he'd go up there and work with Papa Lynn. Well, I don't know, sometimes he might not have been with Papa Lynn, but I don't remember now. I really was there because I remember seeing Mom and Mary. We'd go over to the cookhouse sometime and eat with them. They had cookhouse there. They had a couple hundred men eating there at one time. I mm. mean, the cookhouse was tremendous. I can remember it. I was little, you know. The one that's there at uh, Crab Island. That was when I busted, busted my head open at a storm one night. Where's Crab Island? It was a island that was built during the 20s from the trash from uh here no 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 this new jersey oh new jersey uh what's that hi <laughs> all right nice to see you Simpson. <laughs> nice to meet you yeah good to see you hair looks nice thank you i did, i need a perm but my hairdresser just had some surgery done on her hand, and so I'm having to wait so oh she clusters it down. With yeah. <laughs> well, I'm interviewing Johnny about being a foreman. <laughs> and if it's okay, I'd like to, in just a few minutes, interview you about working at the cookhouse. Oh, I forgot all about what well, well, yeah, he had. You ain't all forgot right. it. You <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Well, what did you feel best about your job? What was going on? I guess it was mainly when we were, when everything was running right, and you know, you were putting the stuff in the warehouse, and uh, a lot of times some of the men be walking around not doing that. Well, there wasn't nothing for them to do right then. You couldn't buy no paint, you couldn't do nothing, fix nothing. So I said, Joel, what do you want me to do? Get them out there to dig a hole? Get them digging six foot deep, six foot wide, six foot uh, long, and then cover it up and then dig another one? I said, I thought what we, the main thing for this factory was when them boats come to the dock, we get them fish out of that boat, process them through this factory, put the scrap in the scrap house, the oil in the tank, Load it on the cars or whatever comes after it, and the money comes to you. I said, I thought that was the main thing. I said, you don't pay them enough to push them too much. Back yonder, you could do it. Like when Daddy come running, they had a truck that run the Harlow that carried them in and brought them back. And that's the reason they had mostly Harlow men. But in later years, they got to get in their own cars, you know, so they could leave and come back when they wanted to. You had no way, you had, really had no control. When Daddy was there, he had control. When Popsicle was there, he had control. They put a fence around the place. They could only get in right when he wanted them to. 
Well, Joe had a fence around it, but it was unlocked all the time. <laughs> they still go in and out. Were the men paid minimum wage? Yeah, mostly. Once in a while, if it went up just a little bit, I think when I first started there, I was getting paid 75 cents to start with, then I went to 90 cents. Got 90 cents an hour, I don't know, for five or six, seven years, then they went to a dollar. Then a few years later, they went back to 90 cents. And I think that was when Piggy got in trouble. Because the labor laws got after him or something, and he had to pay all the B and a lot of back pay. Boy, they hated that. <laughs> I think I got about $1,500 or something like that. And then he lowered your wages to make up for it? No, he had already lowered them. That was the reason he had to pay that Oh, later. he got in trouble for that. Mm -hmm. I got you. I in other you. words, he he had raised us a dollar an hour before the law went up to a dollar. Yeah. But after, he didn't know the law was going to a dollar and they wasn't catching any fees. And <laughs> so he, lo he lowered the payback down. He wasn't supposed to. He got caught. Now, what about towards the end, some of these men that had been working there 30, 40 years, what were, were, did they get raises for being there so long? No. I paid them, most of them, the older ones, I paid them a little extra to kind of watch out, yeah. stay there a little longer and watch the dryers, stuff like that. I'd give them two or three hours a week or something. Because they had a lot but of knowledge. I wasn't supposed to do that. Yeah, they had a lot of knowledge about the factory, didn't they? Oh yeah. yeah. And that's what I when they when see when I left them down there they could they could we had already had this trouble once. But here the boat started with catching all these fish and they couldn't do nothing with them. They were hauling them across the road. I saw them bobcats are going across that road of carrying it and you could see the tracks. They had wore the places right in the ground of going over there. Ross told me he said, I know we hog 10 million over there. Why? They couldn't, they couldn't handle it. Why? They didn't know how. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> See what Jewel didn't understand was each man would help run this factory. They could all of them go down there and run this factory. All of this was, was one of the men that left, one of the main men. He had to have his eyes operated on. Oh, who is that? Zeke. Yeah. And he left. Well, the other one, that was a stupid thing. We had been through this just about a week before this. And I had told Elwood, I said, Elwood, number, watch this now. See, we, in the press room, that's where they got the oil out of the scrap. Mm hmm there was pumps, there were four pumps set to the end of it. But only two of the pumps run at the time. But you had the other two were spires. So if these two went out, you could work these two while you fix these two. One, you had two pipes going into the press pit under the presses. They were four inch lines. And they would pump the water from the press pit one at a time, and it would pump it up over the big screen up top, which was about eight or ten foot long. It was twice as long as the other three small ones, and they were had real fine mesh in them. Well, the scrap would come, the shaker screen would shake the scrap, it would come down and pull back in the screw. The water would go back down to the other pump, well, it would pump it up, and you would control it with valves over the other three little screens. So, after the big screen, which it had bigger mesh, took the burst out of it, the little screens would handle the other. So, this man didn't realize that Zeke said it always handled the pumps. So Willard, he didn't know nothing about them. And he couldn't 
figure it. He went and done the same damn thing. He opened both valves. So the pump that was pumping over the little screen was also pumping out of the press pit. Mm -hmm. So it was stopping up the pipes and the water, all the water just run over it, run right back in the press pit, run all over everywhere. That's all it was. Did they have to call Zeke back in to fix it? Jewel did. He finally went up there and got him. And Zeke told me later, he said, I kept looking around for you. He said, I kept saying, well, where's Johnny? He never was much of a talker, Zeke, but he would talk if you talked to him first. But he wouldn't go say a whole lot to anybody. And uh, he got him down there after they'd hauled about 20, 30 million cross the road. And <laughs> Zeke, Zeke couldn't, right. even, couldn't even see, could he? Well, he could see out his other eye. Mm -hmm. And he he knew enough. He went right there and got him one. <laughs> I could have gone and got him one, but there wasn't nobody else there that would do it. I believe it was good, but he wouldn't do it because he was mad. I think because he left. Yeah. He didn't want it. He could do could try to get him to run it, but he didn't want to. No, I, don't, I don't think it would do that much about it. Yeah. I mean, it's like I knew because I had to. Uh huh. Every time it would break down, I could fix it. But the man that run in the dryer room, he knew what to fix on the dryers. He knew how to work that. Man on the dock, he knew about that. Man in the press room, he knew about that. Man in the scrap house, he knew about that. But you couldn't take that man off that scrap house and stick him right in his dryer room to run the dryers or the presses or the oil machines. Each man could run his part. But no one of them could run it all. Mm -hmm. I had to run it all. I had to know about every bit of it. So that's another big job of the foreman is to be the sort of mastermind. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, I mean, it's the same anywhere. Mm -hmm. The foreman's got to run the plant. That's right. I don't care if you're in a car producing place or what. That's what they got the foreman's for. Did anybody ever get hurt, Johnny? Yeah, over several times. One man got his leg cut off down there in the drag. Were you there? Yeah, yeah, I didn't see it. I was, I think it happened while I was going when I broke my leg, I believe it was. 1977, I broke my leg. And uh, I had just brought me a new truck. Pop said, well, he put me in the scrap house to run it. I didn't like that. You couldn't get that off of you. I don't care what you did. You get away from down here, you wouldn't smell it. But I could get to town or somewhere like that, and I'd start, you smell that scrap coming out your skin. And uh, anyway, I was pulling one of the doors in the scrap house, and I pulled sideways real hard. The day before, I had pulled on one of them lines. I pulled back like this, and it broke, and I fell down and hit my head on that concrete and thought I'd kill myself. Mm. So the next day when I was pulling on it, I pulled sideways. And when I pulled real hard, it broke, and I spun around on my leg, but my, on my leg, but my foot didn't turn. I twisted my leg in two. And, uh, uh. I think it was pretty sure, because I remember I went down when that happened. But, uh. That's how you broke your leg? Yeah, I was in the scrap house. Well, how did somebody get their leg cut off? Well, he was in the roll box. Mm -hmm. That was the worst job down there. What's that? The roll box. That's where, see, I guess when you come down there, they blowed them in the drag. With a big hose, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, before that, they always just used pitchforks. To shovel the fish. Mm -hmm. onto the conveyor. Yeah, but the conveyor was in the floor. And it's still pulling these wide paddles. Mm -hmm. And they weren't supposed to get ahead of their doors. They had, all they had to do was hit on the side of the wall. They man knew what to do. But evidently the man that's sitting out there fell asleep or something and he didn't hear them and they kept right on the going to it. They don't like to see the drag get empty, see. And they were blowing fish too then, but it was probably some of them 
dry things that we caught sometimes, and little ones, wasn't even enough oil to run the oil machines. Mm -hmm. And they were hard to even blow in the drag. So I think he got ahead of it, and the piece broke down, and he went back to it and stepped in that hole, and that drag got him. Oh, was the um, conveyor, conveyor pulling the fish yeah. down into a hole? No, no. The conveyor on the end of the dock, yeah. where you look in the door, uh -huh. you see a conveyor, it goes there and goes up like that. Yeah. Well, it goes overhead, and there's doors up there that you open and drop the fish in the box. Yeah. But there's also a door goes to the cooker. Uh-huh. And they got that door open, but the cooker takes what it wants or what it can. Mm -hmm. Rest of them go on by, and they drop down in the end. Before there's a compartment, before the pick, before the drag gets to the end, and the fish drop into that, and goes down to the bottom. The scrap the drag goes on around, goes down there around another sprocket, picks them up, and carries them on back through again. So. They trying to keep that drag full, see. Because if you let it get down empty, then you got to work twice as hard to fill it up. Ah. So anyway, I think that's what happened. He, he stepped into it? Mm-hmm. And, and it, cut his, it cut his leg off? Well, it tore it up. Ah. Mm. And you know, it, uh, probably the, it, I think he lost his leg. It wanted to kind of, it dug it, it tore it up so bad that infection you know that was nasty in there oh yeah couldn't be no other way the infection got in they had to take it off mm. so when i come back he was cool mm. and he was a good man what was his name i don't even remember what yeah. his name was that was in the early 80s that's been 30 years ago yeah and i don't even remember his name now i remember Right, many of them's names. I remember one fella got burned, didn't he, one time? That was William Bryant. Mm -hmm. uh, a hole come in a pipe in the caustic tank. We had a steel tank down there, and you had steam lines in the bottom of it to heat it. Put water in it, pour caustic soda in it, and they used it to clean the oil machine parts. About the only thing you could clean them with. And the hot body of it basically was real strong box of ice. And he was standing by the tank and he turned the steam on and that line busted and it blew the caustic right in his face. He come up there, I was standing there, I don't know what it was we were doing, something else. I was already aggravated, but he come up there and the skin was Running, just dripping off his face. I said, God almighty, William, what have you done? He says, I messed up, Johnny. <laughs> I, I didn't know for a while what had happened. Because that was right after that that I left. But that man was hurting. Aww. I saw him after that several times. I believe he wouldn't come back for then, but I believe he'd come back down there. Probably. He told me, he said, I'll go back down there if you go. Aww. His boy was running in the oil machines after that, but he didn't know a whole lot about it. Yeah, so you called the ambulance? Oh, yeah. yeah. I, talk, I hollered in there, told Robert Alice, call the rescue squad, get them down here. Was it, I heard that he didn't want to get in the ambulance. No, he didn't. Uh, he said, I'm too nasty. I said, don't worry about that. Get in that ambulance. I said, you go on over there to that hospital. They'll take care of you. I knew that because they had to come in there and get me that time. How about that? I was sweating, wet all over with sweat. When I broke my leg, I fell down on the floor and rolled over in the floor. Mm -hmm. When they come in there and picked me up and put me on that stretcher, I was full of scrap. <sighs> and they took me, when they, they were taking me out the door, one of the girls come running up there, she says, oh God. <laughs> Where, what is that all over you? You stink, I said. Lady, if I'd have known I was going to break my leg, I'd have took a bath and got all cleaned up for you. 
Oh, that was at the hospital? No, that was when they put me in the ambulance. Oh. Then they had to ride an ambulance with me all the way over there. Oh my God. I got over there and Dr. Way was in a hurry. And he they gave me a shot of Demerol. And he drilled a hole through my leg and put a steel pin through it. Mm. And put a stirrup on it. Mm. Wow. That I had to say, he probably saved my leg. They wanted to send me to Durham. Yeah. And uh, he told Sue, he said, if you let me keep him, he said, I'll save that leg. He'll walk. Or they uh -huh. didn't think I'd ever walk on it again. My gosh. Well, um, Johnny, I'm going to ask about the cookhouse and get Miss Sue in here in a minute. But before uh -huh. we do, is there anything you'd like to add about being a foreman? I don't know of anything. I enjoyed working in the factory, and I enjoyed the last few years a lot less, but I, uh, I made a living, and I'm still li alive. So. Yeah. What do you think about when you drive by now, and you see it all, taking it all down? Yeah, I just wonder what they're doing. I don't really care that much about it. Yeah. Uh, once they get it all going, it'll be better. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and the cook house, they, of course, they quit using that. Sue's so got a picture of that in there, but it's when it's just about to fall down. But there's a picture in there in my hallway of the factory. In, I think it's 1977, mm -hmm. if you want to see it. Well, do you think it is better now that the factory's gone? Well, hmm. Not for the people that made a living in it. It's not better. Yeah. But I think they had a lot of trouble. The place was falling apart. But it was... What about the impact on the economy of Beaufort? I don't know where they got that much out of it. Yeah. Not in later years. Uh-huh. Before that, I mean, they had... Uh... All these companies, uh, uh, iPods, barbers, uh, uh, Huntley's out there, and there were two or three places there to Moorhead that they were put there mainly to handle the peace factory business. Is that right? Well, see, you had at one time, you had two, two factories over to West Beaufort. You had... This one here, there was one on the point down there, mm -hmm. and they had three to Moorhead. Mm -hmm. And I don't know when, I don't remember if Daddy, my father, worked at that one on Starving Island one, one winter, one fall. What island? That little island off from Big Bridge. You look over there, you, you see that brick chimney on it? Yeah, what'd you call it? Starving Island, that's what they call it. Starving? Like you're starving to death? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it was uh, the man that had the factory on it. I can't think of his name now. Was it Phillips? Phillips. Yeah, yeah. Phillips Island. Yep. But Daddy, a bunch of them, everybody worked there, called it Starving Island. <laughs> you got on it, you couldn't get off unless they took you off. So, oh, like when you worked at that factory? Yeah. It was sort of like Alcatraz? Probably, probably about like uh, Crab Island was for Daddy yeah. Work. Tom, I fell down the steps there and busted my head open. Oh my gosh. And they, it was a storm, real bad storm going on, and they couldn't get me to the, uh, I was only about maybe five or six, four or five, something like that. Uh-huh. And it split my head open and all the way I can remember laying down on that table. The blood of spurting. Oh my gosh. My uncle, he was a Facebook captain and uh poor Harvey. He come in there. And he told Daddy, he said, Bunno, he said, get mama and Thelma out of here. What are you gonna do? He said, I'm gonna fix that young. Donnie's gonna die. And they got him out of there, and he went there good. I need told Mama to get him a needle and thread. Who said that? My uncle. Okay. Bert. And he sewed it up. Do you remember that? 
I don't remember much about him sewing. I'm just going by what Mother said, that he sewed it up. That was tough <laughs> now. All well, right. you do what you had to do. That's right. Okay, John, I'm going to stop okay. so we can 